Errol Kulmeister, why do you need AI strategic guidance? Uh, I think in general, you need it in order to get people to start using the, the tools and technologies and to support with the implementation of your AI use case in the organization. Unless you have a strategic guidance or a strategy in place, there is no certainty on how to actually produce and reach the value. Hi, and welcome to Inference, an AI business podcast by Silo AI. I'm Ville Hulko, co-founder of Silo, the largest private AI lab in the Nordics that focuses on building human-centric AI for businesses. With me today is Errol Kuhlmeister. Errol is the co-founder of the AI Framework, an AI strategic advisory. Errol is known for his work pioneering the AI practices of multiple multinational conglomerates, such as H&M, Nordea and Vodafone. With the AI framework, he's now gone rogue, bringing his decades of experience to the open market. In this episode, we'll be taking an overview to what the state of AI management is and what the central themes revolving around it are. Errol, it's great to have you with us. Welcome. Well, thank you, Vila, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I love the, the the intro about me going rogue because that that's what it's all about. I've been going rogue my, my entire career, and I think partially because of that is why I've been successful so far, uh, breaking out of existing structures and making sure that we implement new tools and technology. So a short introduction about myself. I started my careers about 15 or 16 years ago in Nordea Bank, uh, which is now a Finnish bank, at least if you look where they have their headquarters. But mm. back then it was a Swedish bank. Uh, I worked there for about nine, almost 10 years. I did everything from setting up the anti-fraud departments, detecting frauds in real time for the, the Nordics, to the anti-money laundering departments, actually deep diving into to all the transactions of a large-scale bank, to setting up the first vanilla Hadoop clusters in 2014, integrating them with SAS installations, which is quite common in, in large-scale uh, financial institutions and other more legacy legacy companies. I was head on hunted over to, to London in about 2015 as a lead data scientist for the Vodafone Group. So the second largest uh, telco provider in the world with half a billion customers, where I was responsible of setting up the roadmaps and implementing use cases on their very large cluster based out of Italy and Germany. Uh, after that, I was a freelance uh, independent consultant for a short while before I joined Think Big Analytics. Uh, Think Big was purchased by, by Teradata. So I had the opportunity to go around in both the Nordics, Russia, Eastern Europe, UK, parts of the US, Asia, advising and getting insight from some of the largest companies in the world on how they were approaching AI. Then I was um, contacted by H&M when they were doing their large scale implementation or they wanted to do a large scale implementation of AI. And I was recruited in first as a lead data scientist, but then I took over and started heading uh, the department called AI Foundation. So I was a part of building up and implementing all of the, the AI things that they are doing in H&M today. That's lovely and really interesting background you have. And Errol, after earning your stars, if you will, as the AI lead of multiple large organizations. Um, now you've set up a shop of your own. So what is the AI framework? Like, why does it exist? It's a good question. And it wasn't crystal clear in the beginning of what it was that I wanted to do. Uh, I, I like opportunities and I, I looked back at my career uh, because I, I left H&M and I had the opportunity to continue in H&M and build a career in a large company, etc. But it wasn't really attractive to me. If you look at my career and throughout my career, I've been very focused on delivering value with new tools and technologies. I mean, I was a data scientist in the beginning. Uh, I like to say I was never a very good one, uh, but I was a very pragmatic one. And that meant that the things that I was looking at, even from the first models I built for fraud detection, I wanted them to be used. For me, it wasn't that I wanted the most complex models because I couldn't do them in the beginning because I wasn't very good. I wanted people to actually act on the results and I wanted to see something coming back that I could show to, to my peers and, and managers. And 
that was the main point that, that I kind of drove throughout my career. And I realized there are quite clear recipes and blueprints. And in the beginning of the data science hype around 2015, uh, 2014, 2015, there were a lot of people with PhDs in mathematics that were recruited to the data science roles. They were super good at modeling, but I had a hard time finding people that could actually derive value. And I started seeing that the reoccurring pattern of actually implementing and driving value with technology and more specifically AI, because that was the field I was in, was rather on how you approached the problem and how you were driving value and how you were building teams. So going from a technical positioning in my career into becoming more of a manager and implementer taught me a few things on how to actually build the teams, how to set up the clear strategy, how to recruit people, how to improve the operating model, how to take away operational efficiencies, how to break down the barriers between business and IT, how to leverage software engineering best practices, et cetera, et cetera. So when people ask me, what does the AI framework do, I say, well, it's recipes and blueprints for a successful AI implementation. So the positioning on the market isn't that we're expensive management consultants that give you a strategy, but we are not either implementers hands on driving and building the technology. We will provide you with your clear tools and recipes to ensure that you are able to pick the right technology pick the right people and partners to work with, then have a clear implementation plan, and then make sure that people actually use the tools and technologies in place, which tends to be the, the hardest things. You can buy a platform, but a platform by itself won't provide any value unless people are working on it and using it and actually taking some sort of action of the output. So essentially, you've started to focus on all things AI that are non-algorithmic, that have to do with the people that have to do with the process that have to do with the establishing the framework around it, like the company's name says, um, that are not necessarily dependent on the core mathematics that's happening, but as, but in essence, enabling that work. And based on that work, like what do you see as the central topics or as you talk about the recipes and blueprints, um, are there themes or central areas that you typically in your work have found yourself focusing on? Um, what are some of the themes that you your work mostly revolves around? It's a good point, but it's also a very hard point because it depends on the maturity of organizations. Every recipe and blueprints needs to be adopted, in my point of view, to the reality of the company actually that wants to implement it. So there isn't a straight answer. And given that I'm an advisor consultant now, I will always give you the consultancy answer. It depends. But, <laughs> but to be quite fair, some of the, the general teams are how do we get more use cases? How do we get business to understand what they can do? How do we create the architecture or technology landscape that doesn't lock us in, but still enable scale? How do we set up uh, recruitment pipelines? Uh, what are the capabilities that we need to build in a central organization versus a decentralized organization? What's the operating model of successfully implementing a large scale AI organization? So it's, it's high and low, uh, but it has a lot to do with processes and, and people. And then in the end, the, the technical capabilities without going into the algorithmic and, and potentially technical code components. Mm -hmm. And if we start off on the uh, on the general theme of processes and people, like if we take a stab at the AI management side first, it'd be really interesting to get your insights and overviews into what the current topics of discussion around these major themes are. And if we start from the AI management side, um, for the past year, probably the biggest spearhead has been, been the AI management in organizations that already have established AI operations now. So before this, the biggest themes over the past few years were getting AI ops in place, getting the first right people in place, getting the first victories under the belt. Um, but how do you see kind of the state of AI management, if you will, now in 2022? Have these core topics changed or evolved in some direction? Where are we in AI management? Oh, it's a good question. I think there is more of a general consensus today uh, among large enterprises specifically that AI is important. However, it's still not on every manager's roadmap. 
which I find a little bit worrying because we, we know when the rate of change on the outside is faster than the rate of the change on the inside of a company, the, the end is near. So even though the traditional companies with an IT department have three to five year long roadmaps, they haven't even put AI on it and say, we're going to do it in, in five years. That's too slow. So a part of these things is still going out and communicating and emphasizing why it's important. There are several studies showing, uh, I think there was one from McKinsey Lab for, for not long ago or McKinsey Institute showing that uh, they did a simulation. Uh, those companies that are adopting AI, so the front runners, they will have a, a major um, they have a major advantage towards those that are not. They they will actually start lagging behind quite consistently on a value delivery. And it's not because they are innovating with AI still. It's because they are improving operational efficiencies as the first step. That's what all successful uh, traditional enterprises do. They go in and they turn up the volume to max utilizing AI, better forecasting, uh, better existing supply chain processes, better processes in general. So they're just turning up the volume. But what they're doing is as well is taking those additional profits because it is extremely uh, profitable. I think the average ROI uh, up until 2030 has been calculated to be about uh, 15%, if I remember correctly, between 10 and, and 20. So, so it's, uh, it's still quite much, given that they've already trimmed all of the processes quite much. They take all of those profits and reinvest it in reinventing their business models with AI. So they're building up the foundation of how to use it. And then they're starting to innovate on their business models. And you're starting seeing that they are kind of just skyrocketing compared to those that are not even playing that game yet. So when it comes to, to AI management, what you can see that those companies that still are having to be convinced that they need to put AI and data on their roadmap, they are far behind because AI is no longer uh, a differentiating factor or AI is no longer something that is nice to have and, and can be a USP or a unique selling point for a company. It is a hygiene factor. Those that are not la doing it, they will be lagging behind. That's, that's really interesting and kind of picking up on what you're saying. Like one way to see it, I suppose, is from this kind of a micro versus macro perspective, like one of the um, signs of a more mature AI organization, I suppose, is is the narrative and the point of view that they take to machine learning Im implementation, right? So for example, if you consider Netflix, which is one of the more advanced AI companies out there, um, their perspective isn't to transform necessarily on a macro level, the entire business using machine learning. Instead, what it is, and going back to what you said, is just augmenting and improving the efficiency of pre-existing processes with machine learning. Like the recommender system is there, but if you augment that with, with proper machine learning and algorithmics, then you get a recommender system that is 15% better in performance. And like taking this mentality, injecting that into basically all viable, small microscopic conjunctions within an operative process is where you get the efficiency. It's also really interesting to hear kind of what you're saying is also on the macro side is starting to rethink the entire business model, like at the same time, um, um, from the perspective that if we are indeed having access to a technology like this that unlocks perhaps some of the doors that were unlocked that were locked before, for example, with unstructured data, is there something that we can utilize to start reinventing the way our entire business model works? Yes, and there are several uh, successful examples of that. Spotify is one of them. They were mm -hmm. not built on AI and data in the beginning. They were built on the fact that they were able to, to stream music very fast. They utilized BitTorrent technology that was their main unique uh, uh, positioning in the market. That's why one of the reasons, of course, they won. But then when they realized they needed to have better AI capabilities, they needed to re-architect the, the entire platform to be able to do so. So it's about utilizing tools and technologies, not AI specifically, but AI is a good example, given the fact that you can see so much value being derived from it. You can apply it to existing processes and get money. There are very few other tools and technologies that you can actually do that to the entire company. RPA potentially, uh, but not in the same extent, but utilizing RPA in companies with AI, you can get that same effect out. So AI is truly one of those value creators that can accelerate and generate money back to do investments in the organization. Discussing for a moment about kind of the practical ways of organizing your AI operations, like um, when it comes to organizing AI activities and management models, are there any best practices that 
you've identified by, you know, through the in-house work and through working with your clients that you kind of find yourself re-evangelizing when you advise your clientele. Like, are there some unifying factors that you've identified um, across what you could say as the more successful organizations on how their machine learning ops are set up? Yeah, so this is a trial and error uh, approach that I've had the, the last few years, because if you lead the, read the literacy, you're going to get a pro and cons lead of every type of organizational model, and this is how you organize. and rather than organizing based on what a textbook says they give input i rather look at the principles and try to to apply them as well i like to think of building up this type of exercises requires you to to have a lot of focus the the thing you can do to fail if we start with that aspect is hire a lot of talent and then put them out in the business and say go and produce value I know because I've been one of those. Uh, when I was hired into Vodafone, they put me up in the, the risk part and said, go and create a roadmap. We'll see you when you've done that. Um, I wasn't very successful in the beginning until I started actually pushing back and becoming a larger part of that team uh, to be able to, to have some sort of community. What I usually say is you need to build a community, a sense of belonging and a clear purpose for your teams to be able to actually deliver value. So either when you start, you need to create a very strong center of uh, belonging. Some people call it center of excellence, community-based principles. You need to make sure that the experts talk to the experts constantly and that they know that the, the guy working in department A knows where to find the girl in department B. They're working on similar topics. You need to have a community. Otherwise, you'll have a, a sense of, of uh, well, not belonging to the organization because you'll be the odd doc out if you're an expert in that sense and also you need some good leadership which can actually point you to best practices principles the same way you're working how to do technologies you need to organize centrally in the beginning uh, if that's a central organization or decentralized with more uh, more community power i don't know it depends on the organization and the other part is that you need to create a critical mass so that the community becomes big enough in your organization and this is specifically for large enterprises because of course it's hard to do in in small companies but you need to build a critical mass before you can actually start setting up these more independent out in the business team so when people say oh the business needs to be involved yes they need to be involved in setting the right priorities but on the other hand they should be a part of the team and then you need to have this type of guild thinking constantly uh, because you can't have an expert just walking around by themselves. So that's one of the guiding principles that I do, more of a community-based. You need to, to set up that community in organizations. That's really interesting. And, and, and yeah, you're actually touching upon a topic that's for some reason has become sort of a bit of a recurring thing that we for some reason, revisit in the inference episodes, which is the uh, the establishment of m machine learning within an organization. And, you know, there are two creeds that you typically end up following. One is the uh, kind of the distributed model where machine learning talent is embedded into technical teams across the organization. And the second is the center of excellence model where the organization creates um, something comparable to an internal consultancy unit to offer ML capabilities like on demand. Um, and if I'm paraphrasing what you're saying, and please comment and correct me if this is wrong, um, what you're saying is on the earlier steps of an organization's machine learning journey, when the first internal operations are being set up, you would evangelize the center of excellence model. And once that is up and running, and once the community, and once the way of working have been established, then starting to redistribute that out into the technical teams. Or what's your perception on this um, kind of the the stages of organizing around ML operations. Well, I think you you were 100% right on that. So the, the first step is setting up the, the small center of excellence, growing that into a size so you can create capabilities so you don't need to be as hands-on, slowly also educating the, the other teams on how to use and implement. Uh, alongside that, you need to create uh, common tools, components, guidelines, and, and principles to make sure everybody work in the same way to minimize the technical depth, because we all know that machine learning is the high interest rate credit card of uh, software engineering so we need to ensure that there are well-established practices to, to minimize that, uh, what tools, technologies are, are standard and what's ad hoc, etc. 
Uh, as you start growing those teams, you will start dispersing them out into the business. When you're dispersing them out into the business, you will start seeing uh, the bottlenecks as well. What needs to be centralized? What needs to be decentralized? You will start seeing, okay, these different teams are doing the same things over and over again when they are dispersed. That means that we have an opportunity of doing centralized development and provide them with capabilities that will speed up deployment. So you will start creating platform teams as a, as a more mature step, and then you will be providing central capabilities as well. What you'll also realize is there's a difference between providing platforms, what should be a platform type of concept, what should be recipes, what should be templates, what should be accelerators. Uh, all of these things follow quite distinct maturity levels. Uh, and on top of all that, you will probably change your operating model several times just to be able to, to keep up with demand because demand keeps on increasing as the maturity in the organization also keeps on increasing. So it is an involvement and it is a maturity level. And I've seen this pattern in at least five, no, I would rather say seven or eight different companies. That's beautifully articulated. And kind of following the logic of what you're saying with the way of structuring and establishing the teams, like let's talk about the talent and the people side for a moment. Um, so in larger organizations, like be it some of the more mature ML organizations or the ones starting out, I think everyone shares the core challenge of the talent acquisition. So especially for intermediary AI players. So have you identified um, some of the more functional approaches that more successful AI players have taken to attracting and retaining talent um, when it comes to managing your um, AI capabilities? It's a hard question as well. I mean, talent mm. is people. Uh, we talk about it in such abstract concepts, I think. I mean, what I usually do when, when I plan for these things is, why do I pick an employer? when I'm looking for an employer, what attracts me and what makes me stay. And then I generalized a little bit on those concepts. Um, I also read studies. So one of the good studies on how to get high performance team, for instance, the, the Google Phoenix project or, or the research that they did, one of the few longitudinal studies around how to create good teams. It, it is about creating a community, sense of belonging, autonomy. So, so there's so many different things at play. So if we start with the attraction part, how do I get the, the most talented people in the world to come and work with me? Well, first of all, I need to start talking about what I'm doing. A lot of companies are today very secretive with what they're doing. And they believe that, well, why should we talk about the things that we're doing? They are trade secrets. I've lifted the hoods for so many companies and I can tell you this, there are very few trade secrets in this. The most of the time when people say we are doing secret AI stuff and nobody should do it, they're using like logistic regression. If even that, if it's not even a group buy or, or something like that, then call it something else. So start talking about the things that you're doing. And if you're not doing anything, well, start talking about what you want to do and what you're planning to do and what you have uh, the, the mandate to do. Because if it's something people are attracted by, it's, it's honesty and transparency. And everybody loves a grand plan if it's realistic. Yeah, I, I love it that you put it out there. And I, sp I suppose, you know, there's always the, the grand national competition between Finland and Sweden because of the neighboring countries. And I suppose this is one of the competitions that Finland regularly keeps on losing. It's just keeping the cards close to the chest, not putting it out there, not explaining what we're doing and just engineering away. But there's nothing wrong with engineering away. But, but I also think I'm a big supporter of open source, but it's not because I think software should be free or, or those. It's more about, I think knowledge should be free. And I think if you're doing great things or if you're planning to do great things, talk about it because there's so many, well, I don't want to use strong language, but there's so many people that shouldn't be talking about what they're doing that are. The majority of them are salespeople. So if you're doing great things, share it. Of course, you don't need to share the exact numbers. The best presentations I've ever been to are those that give everything away, accept everything in the end. And in order for you to get that information, you have to join them. That's a very good recruiting strategy. Just be more visible about what you're doing, but make sure it, it, it is also something realistically and not just a sales pitch. Everything is a sales pitch, but make sure that you have bring content. Yeah, I, I definitely hear what you're saying about the need for communications regarding to the talent acquisition side and retention side. And I suppose that's one of the big things, because if you consider the proverbial machine learning scientist who has come from the university world and have now over the past few years becoming more accustomed to the 
nuances of the talent markets about shopping around not just for the best salary but essentially for the best team and the most interesting applications where to contribute the skills um talking about it is a really big thing um one of the other things that i'd love to discuss with you before we wrap up is um the question of acceleration so as we discussed in the beginning like now over the past few years the organizations have been establishing their initial ops and now many of the organizations that I assume you work with as well are organizations that are already on the path. Um, so what do you see as kind of the critical second and third steps that the company should be looking out for when it comes to kind of leveling up their AI operations? It's a good question. I'm, I'm thinking about it constantly, to, to be honest. So some of the things that we see is in the beginning, you have the tendency of throwing people solving the problem and putting it into production. I usually call that the, the first stage. Anybody can do that that has the, the budget to it. You can hire data scientists or a consultancy firm and you'll get your first model in production. Usually you don't get the right infrastructure and, and tools in place, but you start to realize quite quickly, uh, especially if you're a large enterprise, that this is super expensive and it's very hard to find a talent as we discussed a little bit earlier. So what do you do then? At H&M, when we were setting things up, we, we hired about 150 people in one and a half, two years approximately. We had around 10 use cases at that stage. So going from zero to 10 models is one thing, and you can just throw people at it. But in order for you to scale from 10 to 100, you need to start thinking about processes, repeatable patterns, and long tail of use cases. So how do you go from 10 to 100? And then a big question is, how do you go from hundred to a thousand different models. How do you make sure that you actually motivate those use cases that have a low ROI, but you need to at least do them because it's free money on the table. So the second step as I see it is starting to hardening that the processes and, and you starting to make sure that there are repeatable patterns. You start thinking about the platforms. You might start buying an end to end platform. Uh, many of the organizations think they should start with an end to end platform. I won't mention any, any names, but I think when I say end to end, no code, low code, I think most uh, people in this space know who I'm talking about or which companies I'm talking about. You don't start with that because you need to prove the value and you need to do your integration. I usually say they are good as a part in the ecosystem component when you have an organization that can actually handle the change management as well. So getting a lot of use cases in there, not spending too much data science and engineering time and then integrating and acting on the results. That's usually step two as I see it. You need to have done something. You need to have some level of maturity. And then step three is having a fully mature organization which has a clear roadmap for use cases, clear customer or business interactions, um, you know how to go to market internally with your products and you know how to scale these things up. So that's usually how I position it. And, and most companies I work with today, they're either in, in one or two. There are very few that still are on step number three, which is the, as soon as I can see it right now, the, the final stage of maturity. And maybe in the future, there will be a step four, which is like innovating on AI and reinventing business model. But that's, that's not the amount of use cases, that's rather the effect of the use cases. Mm. No, I love it that you put it that clearly. It's kind of with the toolkit the proverbial, don't buy a motorcycle if you don't know how to ride a bike type of mentality. And Edel, we're starting to reach the end of the episode, but like as is customary with inference, we love to predict the future and I'd love to get a prediction out of you as well. Um, so yes, you're looking at the AI management space and how organizations are leveling up their game when it comes to their different ways of implementing and integrating and having their machine learning operations in much of a more um, tightly knitted pack. Um, what do you see as the next upcoming trends for these like semi-mature organizations or even rather mature organizations when it comes to AI management? Is it in toolkitting? Is it in management practices? Like what are the next trends in your your horizon? So I might kill my, my own business before it takes off, but, but I actually think what I'm doing shouldn't be needed. Uh, I think that AI management is just a re- writing of what we need to do for real, which is the entire digitalization of companies adopting to technology best management practices. We need to change the way companies operate to actually fully embrace technology. So AI management and why I have positioned towards it, because 
it is easier to understand and implement because it's value driven. All of them are value driven, but it's easy to derive incremental value if you're doing it right. That's much harder with other tools and technology. So AI has provided us with a basis that actually can motivate the investments and give us clear step towards value. So in my point of view, the next trends that we are seeing, hopefully when you're adopting more and more AI practices, is that you start looking wider and start implementing best practices on how to uh, create fully agile teams. How do you implement software engineering best practices? How do you make sure that you focus on, on product development rather than project management? You take away business and IT, you merge them together to make sure you have value focused teams. You have full control over how to build an operating model that can operate in, a, in both a regulated but also an ever changing world. So in my point of view, AI management will hopefully not exist in the, the future, but it's a good way to get started and focus on value here and now. So that, that's my trend spotting. Tremendous. Love the answer. Errol Kulmaster, thank you so much for coming on. And for anyone listening, please do not hesitate to search out the AI framework. Um, it's really interesting stuff, and especially if you're looking to level up the way that your organization is already starting to take the first steps in terms of machine learning. Errol has some great, great, great advice to give you. Uh, once more, thank you for coming on. And for anyone listening, have a great day.